Hello everyone, I'm Jeff Brickman, Senior Investor Liaison at the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Thanks for joining us on this podcast for investors. The purpose of this podcast is to explain some of the key income tax information included in a company's financial statements and to provide investors with tips about how to utilize that information in their analyses. We will also highlight some proposals that the FASB is considering regarding income taxes and provide context as to why they could be useful. There will also be a few accompanying slides throughout the podcast for listeners to follow along. With me today are FASB board member Mark Siegel and practice fellow Jin Ku. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that the views expressed in this podcast are the personal views of each of the participants. Official positions of the FASB are reached only after extensive due process and deliberations. I'd also point out that some of the themes involve tax law and none of the speakers are tax law experts. Additionally, I would like to indicate to our listeners that at any time, if you wish to jump to a certain section of this podcast, you can do so by clicking on the time codes of the individual chapters in the video description section. Mark, could you start us off by providing a brief overview of accounting for income taxes? Sure. Thanks, Jeff. There are many differences between the rules companies follow for their GAAP financial statements and the tax laws they must follow on their tax returns across many jurisdictions including federal, state, local, and foreign. GAAP attempts to portray the underlying economics of a transaction as best as possible. However, tax laws in various jurisdictions sometimes have different objectives than GAAP. A tax law might be designed to encourage or discourage a particular behavior. To illustrate this point, consider the following example, depreciation of equipment. GAAP requires the asset to be depreciated over the asset's economic life. However, a tax law might permit a company to depreciate the same asset over a shorter period, which would give the company higher tax deductions in the current year. The tax law might permit this, for example, to encourage businesses to make capital investments to foster growth. So what are the main tax items typically in the financial statements? Some of the most important tax information can be found on the face of the financial statements, but other important information is in the footnotes. One of the main items is tax expense, which also could be a tax benefit. That you should be able to see on the face of the income statement. Another item is taxes payable. This account is sometimes included within another account on the balance sheet. For example, maybe accounts payable or accruals or other liabilities. Other important items, Jeff, are deferred tax assets and liabilities, which you could often see on the face of the balance sheet. From my experience as an equity research analyst, deferred tax assets and liabilities are probably the most difficult areas to understand in the tax space. Mark, can you explain more about those items? Sure. At a very high level, an investor could think of a deferred tax asset as a tax benefit the company expects to receive on its tax return in a future period. A deferred tax liability is a tax expense it expects to have on its tax return in a future period. Those benefits or expenses could happen in the following year's tax return or many years down the road. To illustrate this concept, let's look at an example. Let's think about a net operating loss, or NOL, which is a common type of deferred tax asset. Let's assume in 2016, a company loses $10 million and the tax rate is 35%. In some jurisdictions, the company will be able to offset income in future years with the $10 million loss in 2016. Therefore, this would create a deferred tax asset of $3.5 million, which is the loss of $10 million times the tax rate of 35%. This deferred tax asset, or NOL, of $3.5 million represents a benefit the company expects to receive on its tax return in a future year. If this company makes $15 million in pre-tax income on a gap basis the following year in 2017, then it would report $5 million of income on its 2017 tax return. That's the $15 million of income in 2017 offset by the $10 million loss in 2016. The taxes due on the 2017 tax return would be $1.75 million instead of $5.25 million. And the deferred tax asset on the GAAP balance sheet would be used, and then it would be removed from the balance sheet. What about a valuation allowance on deferred tax assets? Can you explain what it is? 
Well, if a company doesn't expect that it will actually benefit from the NOL or any other kind of deferred tax asset, then GAAP requires the value of that deferred tax asset to be written down, perhaps all the way to zero. That write-down is called a valuation allowance. Consider the previous illustration about the company that recorded a deferred tax asset of $3.5 million as of 2016. If the company does not expect profits for the next several years and does not expect to earn $10 million in future years before the NOLs expire, it sets up a valuation allowance to re reduce the net deferred tax asset. And that's because the company doesn't expect that it will actually benefit from the NOL. If the company records a significant change in the valuation allowance, an investor might want to understand what the valuation allowance relates to. For example, what business or what country. And they also might want to understand why the valuation allowance changed. In other words, what caused management's view to change? Does the valuation allowance change relate to operations in a relatively small operation? Or is it a signal of a more significant problem with the business? Jin, returning the tax expense or benefit on the face of the income statement, can you give us a little more detail about that number? Sure, Jeff. Income tax expense or benefit is shown on the P&L under income before income taxes. Income tax expense or benefit is composed of current and deferred taxes. For quarters, you might not be able to see this breakout, but for annual periods, you'll be able to see it in the footnotes. Current taxes are essentially the amount of income tax incurred by a company based on taxable income per tax laws and the applicable tax rate for the year. Current tax expense is the amount most closely associated with the company's current year tax returns, although they are not identical. Deferred taxes are the amount of the expense or benefit generated in the current year that the company will see on future tax returns. By way of example, think back to the illustration about the company that loses $10 million in 2016. In its 2016 financial statements, the company would have no current tax expense. It had a loss, so it doesn't have to pay tax. However, it generated an NOL of $3.5 million. Therefore, it would have a deferred tax benefit in 2016 of $3.5 million. So the overall tax on the face of the income statement would show a benefit of $3.5 million. Let's move on to another important topic, cash flows for income taxes. Mark, how can an investor and analyst know what those cash flows are for a given period? Well, total cash flows for income taxes is required information to be disclosed. Companies either include the information at the bottom of the cash flow statement or they include it in the notes to the financial statements. This number is pretty easy to understand. It's what the company actually paid to the taxing authorities. This has been a required disclosure for a very long time, so investors and analysts should have a long time series for that number. So Mark, can you explain why there's a difference between the taxes a company actually pays in a year and the amount that is reflected on the P&L in that same year? Sure. I'll explain a few of the common reasons for those differences. At a high level, though, the difference between cash flow and P&L for taxes is much like other areas of accrual versus cash basis accounting. The company has received a benefit as of the reporting date, but it hasn't collected or it has incurred an expense, but it hasn't paid yet. Think back to our discussion about deferred tax assets and liabilities. Those are benefits or expenses that the company expects to realize on its tax return in future periods. Recognizing those assets and liabilities impacts the P&L, but they don't impact cash flows in the current period. They will impact cash flows in future periods. Another common reason for a difference is that the company has a current tax expense, which is included in the P&L, but it hasn't actually yet paid the tax. It might pay that tax the following year. This is the same idea as, say, a cash bonus that management earns for 2016 results, but the bonus isn't actually paid until Q1. A final example that I will give is settlements with the IRS that are a result of an audit or litigation. A company may have accrued the amount it expects to pay related to an ongoing dispute with the IRS, but the dispute might not be resolved for a number of years. This is similar to how a lawsuit is reflected in the financials. Estimated losses could be accrued before the amounts are paid, sometimes long before the amounts are paid. It is interesting that in any given year, there can be differences between taxes paid and taxes on the P&L. 
but over the longer term, you typically would expect those numbers to be similar. Over how long of a period, though, will depend on the complexity of the company's tax profile. Let's move on to disclosures. Jin, what might investors find useful in the tax footnotes? I'll mention a few key items, but this is an area where it's not unusual for companies to have a couple pages of disclosure in their 10K. There's the breakdown of income tax expense for the period between current, which again is the amount most closely aligned with the tax returns, and deferred, which would include things like the NOL in our previous example. Public companies are required to further disaggregate the current and deferred tax expense by domestic, which includes federal and state, and foreign. Another disclosure that an investor may find useful relates to a company's uncertain tax positions. Tax law can be complex, and sometimes there is risk regarding whether a tax jurisdiction will accept, for example, a deduction that a company took on its return. If the jurisdiction audits the company and rejects the deduction, then the company might be required to pay more taxes. For GAAP purposes, a company recognizes a tax benefit, for example, a deduction, only if the tax position is more likely than not to be sustained by the taxing authority. If a company does not meet the more likely than not recognition threshold, it is required to reserve the position. The tax disclosures include a reconciliation of the beginning and ending reserve balances. These disclosures could help investors get a sense of the company's tax strategies and the risk of future cash outflows for income taxes. Just like with litigation and accruals, though, it's important to remember that the amount disclosed is an estimate. The actual cash outflow amount might be, and probably will be, higher or lower, but the disclosures should give some idea about the magnitude of risks in the company's tax profile. Finally, we save the best for last, the rate reconciliation. A view shared by many stakeholders is that the rate reconciliation is among the most important disclosures regarding income taxes. The goal of the rate reconciliation is to show how a company's actual effective tax rate, calculated as the total income tax expense or benefit per the P&L, divided by pre-tax income per the P&L, compares to the standard tax rate in the company's home jurisdiction. For a U.S. public company, that rate is typically 35 percent. The reconciliation does this by showing the main drivers of the difference between the actual effective tax rate and that standard tax rate of 35 percent. So, put another way, the rate reconciliation helps to answer the question, if the standard tax rate in the U.S. is 35 percent, why is a company paying 25 or 40 percent? Jin, can you go into more detail about the rate reconciliation? How might an investor use this to learn more about a company? Sure. Investors can use the rate reconciliation to analyze whether individual line items in the reconciliation will be sustainable contributors to a company's effective tax rate or are just one-time adjustments. Let's look at an, at an example. On this slide, GAAP pre-tax income is $25.8 million and GAAP tax expense is $5.2 million. At the top of the reconciliation, you can see the standard U.S. tax rate of 35% and at the bottom, you can see this company's effective tax rate of about 20% in 2015. All of the information in the middle of the reconciliation explains why a U.S. company has a tax rate that is about 15 percentage points below the standard U.S. rate. The main driver of the lower rate for this company is interna international operations. For 2015, international operations reduces the company's tax rate by about 13 percentage points. This means that some of the company's income is in foreign countries that have tax rates that are much lower than the U.S. We can also look at trends in the rate reconciliation to understand management's intentions regarding operational and tax strategies, as well as the sustainability of various items. For example, notice that the reconciling item, international operations, is increasing. The trend from 2014 to 2015 alone may or may not be indicative of significant changes at the company, but an investor can review the rec rate reconciliations for an extended period to identify trends. Investors can ask questions such as, was that increase from 11% in 2014 to 13% in 2015 a blip? Or is it part of a longer term trend toward more income overseas that began with a couple percentage points 10 years ago and now is up to 13%? Along those lines, 
Mark, what information in the financial statements could investors use to understand a company's foreign tax exposure? That's a great common question that we get, Jeff. As a start, there are two key data points that give insight into the amount of income a company generates outside the U.S. and the impact of foreign taxes on the company's effective tax rate. Today, the SEC requires that registrants disclose a breakout of GAAP pre-tax income and income tax expense between domestic and foreign. Also, as we just discussed, a common item on the rate reconciliation is foreign operations. Those two data points should give a user an overall sense of the company's tax profile. For example, assume a U.S. company's effective tax rate is 25 percent and the U.S. federal tax rate is 35 percent. An investor should understand what is causing the difference. If the lower rate is due to the company having significant earnings outside the United States in lower tax jurisdictions, then it should see pre-tax income from foreign jurisdictions and it should see a foreign related item in the rate reconciliation. Continuing on with the topic on foreign exposure, how does an investor know where the earnings come from? A company is able to minimize taxes by generating income in countries with tax rates lower than the United States and therefore investors are trying to gain insight into foreign tax exposure. As part of the FASB's Income Tax Disclosure Project that will be published for commentary in July, the FASB proposed certain disclosures that would give users additional information about a company's foreign operations. One of those disclosures would be income taxes paid, broken down by significant foreign country. So, in addition to the public disclosures being required to disclose gap pre-tax income and income tax expense between domestic and foreign, they will also disclose taxes paid between domestic and foreign and even further disaggregated or broken down by significant foreign countries. So what does this mean for investors? Well, investors would have additional information to potentially help them assess foreign tax exposure. Let's take a look at an example of how investors could use the information for their analysis. Note that this example assumes that the proposed tax disclosures are effective for the years presented. The company in this example discloses gap pre-tax income and income tax expense, which are the first two rows in the table, for the fiscal years 2013 to 2015, and those have been broken down between domestic and foreign. From this information, an investor could calculate the effective tax rate by dividing the income tax expense amount by the pre-tax income amount. This rate is shown in the next row. Further, as part of the new disclosure, the company would be required to disclose the tax payments, that's actual cash flows out the door, to domestic and foreign jurisdictions. Similar to the effective tax rate, an investor could calculate the cash tax rate based on the company's pre-tax income and analyze differences between the effective tax rate and the cash tax rate. This cash tax rate is shown in the table. Another new requirement would be that the company would need to disclose the foreign tax payments by significant country. This information is shown in the table at the bottom. In this example, the company made significant foreign tax payments to the United Kingdom, Russia, and China. Each investor would have to decide how to use this new information, but here are a few examples of questions that one might consider. What is the mix of income from the U.S. and foreign locations, and what is the trend of that mix? Does management expect that trend will continue? What are the trends in tax rate the company is paying around the globe? What is the political and economic environment in the major countries in which the company operates, and what does that mean about the possibility of tax increases or decreases? If the company paid significant taxes in a jurisdiction for the last couple of years and little to no taxes in the current year, what is driving that? If the company had significant pre-tax income on a gap basis but paid little U.S. income tax, why is that? So all in all, the information would not definitively tell an investor the entire story behind the numbers, but it provides an additional level of transparency for investors so that they can further look into, and it should provide a starting point for discussions with management. Thanks, Mark.
I think those proposed disclosures would help investors ask better questions, and based on feedback we've heard to date, will be very well received by the analyst community. What can an investor look to for information about the future, about the risk of changes to a company's effective tax rate? Well, just like making estimates about future revenue, margins, EPS, impact of changes in technology and regulations, and so on, making estimates about future tax rates is challenging. A tax jurisdiction can change the tax rate, or a tax jurisdiction can put in place laws that prohibit tax strategies that companies have been using to minimize their taxes, and that can be very hard to predict. Over the last couple of years, there have been a number of jurisdictions that are focused on reducing deficits by increasing their tax revenue. In many countries around the globe, there also has been an increase in audit activity from the taxing authority. So personally, I think one of the best things an investor can do is understand the company's tax profile and ask maybe some of the following questions. Are most of the company's earnings from the U.S. or from other locations? Does there seem to be a change in that mix over time? For each of the foreign locations, what is the current tax environment? Is there an expe expectation that taxes will increase? Is that government under fiscal strain and looking for ways to increase tax revenue? Investors will make assumptions and estimates about future cash flows based on their view of the answers to these and other questions. Jin, we talked about how some U.S. companies minimize their taxes by having income in low-tax foreign jurisdictions. Can you summarize at a high level how the current U.S. tax laws work with respect to foreign earnings? Sure. Under the U.S. tax rules, a company generally would be taxed on foreign earnings when it brings those earnings to the U.S. Those foreign earnings would be taxed at the U.S. tax rate, less the tax payments already made to foreign jurisdictions. Assume a company has $10 million in foreign earnings and pays 10% in foreign taxes on those earnings. The company then repatriates those earnings to the U.S., at which point the company would be required to pay U.S. taxes on those earnings. The amount of U.S. taxes will depend on a number of complex factors, but typically it would be less than the, U the full U.S. tax rate of 35 percent. Current accounting rules require a company to accrue U.S. taxes on those foreign earnings unless the company asserts, and many of them in fact do assert, that it will indefinitely reinvest those earnings. If a company makes this assertion, it is required to disclose the cumulative amount of indefinitely reinvested earnings and the potential tax liability on those earnings if determination of that liability amount is practicable. Due to significant uncertainties involved in determining the potential tax liability, many companies take the practicability exception and do not disclose the potential tax liability on the indefinitely reinvested foreign earnings. However, companies still have to disclose the amount of earnings indefinitely reinvested. Many companies have a significant amount of undistributed earnings for which no U.S. taxes have been recognized because the company does not plan to bring the funds back to the U.S. for the foreseeable future. If most companies are taking the practicability exception and not disclosing the estimated U.S. tax liability for those foreign earnings, is there other tax information in existing or proposed accounting standards that would give investors an indication of the cash outflows that might occur if the earnings are eventually brought back to the U.S.? Ideally, investors would have the estimated tax liability associated with the indefinitely reinvested foreign earnings to assess potential tax risk. However, as mentioned before, many companies take the practicability exception and don't disclose this amount but companies are required to disclose the cumulative amount of indefinitely reinvested foreign earnings. So investors could use this information and other information, such as the comparison of the U.S. tax rate and foreign tax rate, which is typically shown as part of the rate reconciliation in the footnotes to give them a sense of U.S. tax exposure. Another thought is that some companies do disclose the estimated tax liability. So, as a data point, an investor could look at the incremental rate that similar companies uses to estimate the liability. However, there is no exact science and many different factors could impact the timing of repatriation of undistributed foreign earnings. The FASB recently decided to propose a disclosure of the aggregate amount of cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities held by foreign subsidiaries.
They thought that this, this disclosure, in combination with existing disclosures in the financial statements and elsewhere, like the MDNA, would give investors more information about undistributed foreign earnings. I think it's best to illustrate the usefulness of this, this disclosure with an example. So in this example, the company has made the following disclosures based on existing disclosure requirements. The cumulative amount of indefinitely reinvested foreign earnings is $50 million. No information is given regarding the potential liability amount on the indefinitely reinvested foreign earnings because the company determined it was not practicable to calculate that number. The company also has debt in the U.S. of $1 million due in the next three months. It has cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities of $2 million at the consolidated level. Finally, the company disclosed in its subsequent event footnote that it entered into a material definitive agreement to purchase a company in New York for $3 million. As part of the new disclosure requirement, the company also disclosed that it has a total of $1.8 million in cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities held by foreign subsidiaries. Given this information, an investor could come up with the total amount of cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities held domestically. This would be $200,000, which is calculated as $2 million less $1.8 million. So what does all this information tell an investor about repatriation on undistributed foreign earnings? Well, based on the facts in the example, most of the cash is offshore, so the question an investor could ask is whether the company will have sufficient cash in the U.S., i.e. cash balance, cash flow from operations, and access to capital markets like debt borrowing and sell of stock to operate without bringing back the funds from overseas. Investors could turn to the liquidity disclosures in the MDNA section of the 10K as additional insight. An investor could consider if the company does need to bring some of the overseas cash back to the U.S., what amount of that cash will be needed to pay U.S. taxes. Thanks, Jin. That's helpful. Other hot topics in the media are inversions and earnings stripping. Mark, could you briefly tell us what these are? Sure. I'll tell you how the terms are commonly used, but different people sometimes use the jargon to mean different things. Inversion is a practice of relocating a company's legal domicile to a lower tax jurisdiction, usually while retaining its material operations in its higher tax jurisdiction. In other words, in an inversion, a company is essentially reincorporated overseas. This can have the impact of reducing a company's tax expense. Earnings stripping is a strategy sometimes used by companies to reduce taxation in higher tax jurisdictions jurisdictions by using deductions for interest paid to its foreign subsidiaries in lower tax jurisdictions. This has the overall effect of lowering a company's taxes. For example, a foreign subsidiary of a U.S. company can make a loan to a U.S. subsidiary for operational expenses. The U.S. subsidiary sometimes is allowed to deduct interest payments to a certain extent. Although the foreign subsidiary might have to pay taxes on the interest income it receives from the U.S. subsidiary, that interest income would be taxed at a lower rate than it would had it been in the U.S. If a company already has undertaken one of these strategies in a significant manner, a user should be able to identify this using the information previously described. For example, a user can look at the source of pre-tax income or can look at the rate reconciliation. There are also required disclosures about material guarantees. And if a parent company guaranteed an intercompany loan on the books of a subsidiary, an analyst might be able to gain insight about it from looking at disclosures about the guarantees from period to period. If a company has not undertaken one of those strategies, there probably isn't any way to know without asking management about its future plans to minimize taxes. This would be like an investor asking management whether it plans future acquisitions or restructurings. One final topic. Mark, can you explain when a change in tax law is disclosed in a company's financial statements? One notable proposed disclosure that was not covered yet in this podcast is related to changes in tax laws. Under this proposal, a company would be required to disclose a description of an enacted change in tax law that is probable to have an effect on the company in a future period.
So, for example, assume the president signs a new tax law in 2016 that a company determines would likely have a material impact in the following year, 2017. Under the proposal, the company would be required to describe this enacted tax law in its footnotes. Under current GAAP today, investors may already get this information as part of the company's subsequent events disclosure, but sometimes they may not. Great. That concludes our discussions on income taxes today. During the podcast, we mentioned several of the FASB's proposed tax disclosures. We welcome and really need investor feedback on these disclosures. Please give us your feedback, whether through a comment letter or an informal phone call or email, in which you don't even need to receive direct attrib attribution. You can contact me at jmbrickman at fasb.org or 203-956-5219. Additional information, including all of our contact info and further details around the proposed standard regarding income tax disclosures, can be found at www.fasb.org.